Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to this uh, new installment of this uh, uh, SCLT lectures uh, seminars. Uh, well, it is a pleasure you know, for me today to have uh, uh, Professor Uri Hesberger from University of Haifa. Um, Professor uh, Hesberger, you know, is a is a highly multidisciplinary has a highly multidisciplinary background, and I think this will show up uh, in uh, his uh, lectures. And uh, and um, he, he, you know, he currently is at University of Haifa, but before he was uh, at the Israeli Institute for Advanced Studies at the Hebrew University for for quite a while. And I guess he was uh, trained uh, in that university to uh, he got a PhD at the University of uh, the Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem. So uh, and uh, but uh, and last not least, uh, you know, the the, the the aim of this seminar is to uh, get him acquainted with uh, with our community because uh, he will be spending a sabbatical leave uh, in, at the CLT starting from uh, uh, July, right? Uh, not July, September. September, okay, starting from September onward. So and uh, you know and, and we are very happy that uh, he took this decision, and uh, and let me welcome him. Uh, on behalf of the whole community. And without further ado, please, uh, Yuri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so th so thank you, Akil, and thank you to all of you for having me here, for that, giving me this opportunity to talk to the to the, ECL, to the European Center for Living Technology. Um, when I... I want to apologize in advance if this talk is a little bit like this, because uh, usually I try to talk about things I discovered and not so much about how I think about them, although that, of course, creeps in. But this time, also because I want to introduce me myself, I am going to spend some time talking about how I think about biology and how I think about studying biology. And, um, and uh, I have to say that when I, um, when I was looking at the university to find places I could go and when I found the ECLT, uh, um, the name of this place really resonated with how, um, of basically some of the things that always bother me, which is how do you know that something is alive or what is a living system and how can you learn from living systems? And then so the idea of living technology has to have that somewhere inside it. Um, and so I will sort of st start upside down um, and uh, introduce first of all my lab which usually does things that I'm not going to talk about so much today. So we are a systems biology lab, and we have lots of students and funding from the NIH and the, and, and the EU. And, um, and we are right now at the University of Haifa. I, I, I forgot to mention um, that before that, we w I, was, um, I had a lab uh, in an engineering department, a biomedical engineering school in, in the US, and also um, in the Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, and but in essence, the, the, lab, the lab, the, f the focus of the lab is studying B cells to look at selection in different scales. And um, let me see one second. I'm trying to move all of you aside a little bit. Um, if I have to say, I'm not so used to this. If, if anybody has a question or wants to ask something, or if I say something that's unclear, then please unmute and ask. Okay? Don't. Um, you can't throw me off by asking a question. In fact, the thing that will make me a little bit go crazy is that everybody is just a black square and I can't see your faces and um, you're not saying anything. So if you feel like opening your video, that would really help me. And if you have a question, just wave at me. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping you here in my view in my viewport. Okay? Um, thank you. So, um, and, and the idea here, so B cells are those cells that create antibodies, and I'll talk a little bit more about them later on when I want to tell you things about them. But in essence, those are the cells, those very unique cells that we have in our body, that each, each one of them knows how to generate um, a unique receptor. And then when we have an immune response, and these receptors are the same receptors that they also release as antibodies, and when we have an immune response, they actually do something even stranger for, bio for, for cells in our body. They mutate on purpose. So then you have a bunch of mutate, mutant receptors, and these mutant receptors compete with each other until eventually you have a subset of this population that is very good at responding to the, the, whatever disease is bothering you. Um, and the reason why I say that, or the reason why we can use them to look at selection at different scales is because on the one hand, 
you have this mini evolution, this mini laboratory for selection in your body, which is the B cells competing to, in, to, to interact with a disease or with a cancer or some other thing that's going on in your body. And on the other hand, you have the population of people who are suffering from disease or suffering from, other, from some um, issue, and they have, each of them have their own repertoire, and that's, so that's another scale of evolution right there. And I'll talk about, and in fact, there are other scales that we could look at. And, I, and, and, and this is sort of the part where things maybe get complicated. Um, so if, sorry, I, I, my figures are too complicated, maybe. So um, if this is two scales, I, cannot, I can now translate them even, in, in, even into more scales. So if this, so here in this figure, which is, was in a, in a commentary we made in Trends in Immunology a few years ago. Um, so you see the level of the single cell, where you see how um, each cell takes its genetic material, its segments, and recombines them to create a unique receptor. This unique receptor is tested in the body to make sure that it actually functions. You then have a population of cells that are doing the immune response. and and reacting to different things. But these two levels that were also in the previous figure are only part of what makes a functioning immune system because what's also influencing this is not just the survival of the person with the immune system, but the way that their immune system uh, allows for a certain evolution of a certain population. And if we look across species, we can see that, you know, all vertebrate species above a, of a, above a jawless fish, above a lamprey, have an adaptive immune system. Their solutions, though, are not identical. And the way they, they all need an immune system, an adaptive immune system, um, but how it functions and the exact details of it are different and depend on their lifestyle. And then, in addition to that, we have the co-evolution of all of these species and the biomes and the viomes, which are not just about how a virus infects and how a, path a pathogenicity develops, but also how these ecosystems cohabit, right? Because at the end of the day, most of the bacteria that live in our body are not pathogens. And um, and most and, and definitely most of the viruses and microbes that live on this planet and that are key for basically the ecological survival of the planet have nothing to do with pathogenicity in our bodies. And so this so that this is more or less I would say what my lab the things my lab focuses on. And now I, I just want to make sort of a few comments, which again, these are the kinds of comments I would never make, definitely not at the beginning of a talk. But, um, and I wrote this in, in, in my abstract, but at the heart of how we study things and how I think it's important to study things is this idea that living systems have goals but no functions. And what do I mean by that? I don't, what I mean is that usually when we look at pieces of living systems and, and, and ascribe a function to them, um, we are doing it from a very uh, limited perspective. And that is even including the way we treat the immune system. So if you go to a one-on-one -on -one immunology course and uh, the teacher teaches you about the immune system, they will say the immune system is there to fight pathogens and is a kind of a barrier from pathogens. And in fact, if it in encounters something in the body that is not itself, it will kill it. But this is just simply not true. Okay, So the immune system... Is, is, is not really a kind of a border. It's a process of molecular interactions, some of which are involved with um, defeating pathogens, but some of them are involved with dealing with completely uh, self-induced processes like cancer. So we now know that uh, without the adaptive immune system, cancers run rampant in our body, and those have nothing to do with pathogens. And similarly, um, if we talk about a vaccine, um, so vaccines are not, again, are not protective mechanisms. They're not, uh, it's not like wearing a shield. A vaccine is actually an education vector. It's a way of teaching the immune system about a disease in a way that doesn't require you to actually be sick. And, and, um, and, I, and, I, and, and to my mind, and again, um, this is, I think one of the reasons why it was important for me to bring up these three points is that I have spent the last two years arguing with neighbors and everybody I know more or less sort of about what's going on and people are very worried about what is going on and should they vaccinate themselves and is it real and all kinds of questions like that and I think a lot of it has to do with a very naive um, perspective on biology um, and 
and a misunderstanding that again biology is 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 a set of processes and that our our perspective and our uh, naming of things as specific functions is um is actually harmful for our understanding and so if people are scared of a vaccine because they think it won't actually protect them and um and that it might actually sort of in some way actually harm them rather than understanding it as a way of teaching a way of teaching a certain arm of your body that can't be taught by reading books but can be taught by giving given being given antigen examples um and again, more generally, I think this leads to, a, and, and this is the last time I want to talk about this, that we need to sort of move beyond war metaphors to describe immune responses and immunity and microbial and viral pathogenesis. And I think a lot of this has to do with really describing things as us and them rather than processes to an environment. Um, okay, so... Having said all of that and have given that aside, I, I want to go a little more into um, so what what does that mean? What is the problem with uh, um, with defining biological systems? Um, I, actually, I should say something else uh, like this. One of the reasons why we um, we we have this tendency to think of um, of uh, us and them of, of defining these borders where uh, this is a living system and these are and outside of it are the things that are trying to harm it have to do with the fact that when you look at living systems one of the things that is very clearly um, a definition is that uh, that they are individuals so we can look at a cell and we see a cell is a thing in the membrane that self-replicates or a person is also an individual so we see a certain very clear borders and um, uh, Varela, Francisco Varela, actually sort of made this what I what I always thought was a very good definition of what a living system is. So basically, he defined it as an autopoetic machine, autopoesis. You have an identity, which then entails a domain of interaction, which causes the emergence of information and an intentional link, and some kind of operational closure. So. An entity that does things for itself is a subjective thing in itself, closed off from everything else, and maintains its identity. And you have this kind of closed loop, which again can be broken if you die, but otherwise is maintained. And this led to sort of this kind of a, a minimalist description of a living organization, which he used to de describe a cell. So you have membrane boundaries, a clear boundary that permits some kind of dynamics of a metabolic network that produces, sorry, um, metabolism that constitutes itself. So it's a machine that makes itself and maintains this boundary. So again, so you have a living system that is isolated from the rest of the world. Now, Let's, now we come to the immune system, or to any other kind of system where we are looking at um, a multicellular organism, what, again, Varela used to call a, a second-order autopoietic machine. Now, in this system, it's not one cell, but it's actually across multiple scales, because this living system is itself built both of interactions at the level of single cells talking to each other, population of cells behaving together in some action that leads to um, the function of the system, and at the end, the whole body, okay? Now, in this system, and again, I think some of it, it, it's worth noting that Francesco, Francesco Varela was a neurobiologist. He, he then used the same model to talk about um, the cognition in the brain. So we have some kind of sensory motor coupling that's only protruded by the outside and then has effects. This modulates the dynamics of an interneural network and generates ensembles of behaviors internally and again maintains the sensory motor coupling. So you have a closed system that just interacts with the outside world. Now, when, um, when Varela uh, tried to do the same for the immune system, and he had the suggestion, basically in Varela's uh, um, description, 
and this is why I called it the first definition of cognition, because I'm going to come in a second to a second one. Cognition was basically um, the need for cooperation amongst many first-order apotopoietic machines to create a closed system that is the self. So the self of the brain, and he also applied it to the self of the immune system. Now the problem with that, when you look at the immune system, and, and I actually wrote a paper about this in my PhD, which I won't bring up now, but is in very general terms is that the immune system is clearly not closed. Okay? So first of all, you have the very fact that it's very, very distributed. But also, um, your immune system is not just influenced, it's very compo composition, is not just influenced by how um, the cells interact, but also um, what kind of microbes you have in your body. And not only that, when, when you generate this repertoire of cells in the beginning, the thing that you have to use as an example is not pathogens, because your body, to begin with, is the bereft of pathogens, it's actually the proteins in your body. And, and as a final sort of, um, I would say, caveat to this kind of thinking, of it being a closed system that is just internally referential, if, if, you, um, if you look at us and at the pathogens that invade us, we use the same molecules. In fact, um, the way to become a pathogen that can possibly live in our body is to make proteins that are more like us. So if you wanted to um, generate a system that was blind to everything um, that was um, similar to us, it would be essentially like uh, um, creating a, a non-background visual system, right? It makes much more sense to think of this system as a system that takes the self, takes the body, and uses that as a template to see how things are different given this template, okay? Now, this um, this leads to a second de uh, definition of, of, of cognition in the immune system, which does not think about closure so much. It's not thinking of how you define the self, but rather thinks of the self as something that is emergent from a series of processes. And uh, again, I have papers about this, which I will mention in a second, but I think this idea started from a paper by Henriette Lan and Irun Cohen. Irun Cohen was my PhD supervisor. And here, basically what they say is cognition is really that system that takes, that generates meaning. So instead of just translating information, it takes information in context, and which, which essentially means it looks at the specific T-cell or B-cell response and sees what other molecular contexts it is being excited in, and in that way, learn something about the meaning of uh, the biological process that it is undergoing. And so then, instead of the little picture I showed you from Varela, I can show you a picture from their paper. And in essence, what's happening here is, and what makes a cognitive um, behavior, is you have some kind of information, a process, it is inputted into the system, to its sensors, and then there is a, the cognitive system is basically the system that makes this kind of a feedback and feedforward loop. So it inputs the system, it makes a choice, it does some kind of an action. This action both influences how your future inputs will look, and also will, 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 will modify your future outcomes. And so a process, okay? And as you and as is important for a process, there's a there's a directionality to it. And being on this end is is categorically different than being on this end. And sort of in my papers, which are these two, I added the sort of I added the additional information or the additional point that we all have histories. So a cognitive system is not going to make one decision or learn one thing one time. Okay, it is a system that actually starts out naive, a tabula rasa, if you want, and then at first learns a lot of behaviors and and modifies itself until it can create good actions, good adaptive actions, and then once it's had learned those behaviors, will now only do smaller smaller adaptations. So we have the history of previous choices, and. 
And what, and what this difference of cognition, so if we accept this definition of cognition as opposed to the previous one, a, a, a definition of cognition that talks about process, a process of interaction and learning from the environment, then we need to accept that there is no closure, there's no closed systems, only stable attractors. So if a person or if the immune system is, is, is reacting, it's not that eventually it will learn how to completely close us off from the outside world. It's constantly modifying its patterns of behavior. Or another example, right? We start out as an embryo and we end up as a whole human being, but this embryo is as complete as this person. It's just a different developmental stage. And so the process constantly at every stage of development has a different set state that it is trying to achieve. And so if this is Varela's uh, description of a of an autopoetic machine, a machine that's enclosed and generates itself, I would suggest this kind of a model. You have ongoing set states, there is an arrow moving forward in time, and at every point it is trying to reach some stable attractor. But as it reaches it, a new one arrives, okay? And so you keep on moving forward this process that is called life, okay? And now What's even more uh, important to sort of remember is that because of that, these arrows that were only one directional in uh, Varela's um, um, illustration are actually two-way. Okay? This identity is not closed. It's actually defined also by its domain of interactions. So if I, um, if I have many good ideas but I get the opportunity to tell them to you, I become a different person. I'm not the same person who had these ideas only for himself. And the same way, the identity and closure are interacting with each other. So in other words, for every, play, every position that in Varela's representation only had one direction, there are actually two. That's one, one, one difference between these two. The second difference, which is very important to remember, ah, sorry, I forgot, I have another slide. So, so if we think about it this way, why is the brain still a good uh, representation of cognition? Because if you remember, ah, yes, John. Uh, thanks for responding so quickly. Uh, how do you distinguish between a backwards arrow and going around the whole loop, which also causes uh, an influence in the other direction? So uh, again, to me, it, it's because I, I don't, I, I think, um, I, I would say that um, they have. Uh, it's a more immediate. Uh, it's a more immediate um, significance. So, um, in order, in order to have, uh, um, or in order to define what my identity is, I would. I, I need to know my domains of interaction, um, and not just for the sake of operational closure. So operational closure, at least the way I interpret what Varela used to say, what used to say about this, is really um, the functions that um, that are required so I don't dissolve. Okay, and in the cases of domains of interaction, it's not um, as severe. And, and 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 again, I'll bring it up in a second again. But the the the, the metaphor that I like a lot is um, Mikhail Bakhtin's ideas of speech genres. I don't know if you know that. It's basically the idea that language and speech, if you want to divide them into the bit parts, they are um, um, uh, types of conversations. So a speech genre, for instance, so giving a lecture is a kind of a speech genre. Talking to colleagues in science is a speech genre. Um, uh, speaking to, to your students is a different, or to your mother would be a completely, you, you can't say the same kinds of things depending on who you're talking to. And, and some of them are very automatic. So without knowing any Italian, I could probably order a meal in Italy because when you're in a restaurant, there's only so many things people are saying to you. So I think that when, you, when, when um, if you apply that a bit wider, you can see how domains of interaction directly influence identity because there's a limit. I, I'm, suddenly I become a different person or a different animal. And, and you can see this in a very categorical way, let's say, for instance, in immune cells. So B cells that are living in the spleen can uh, form a germinal center and start an immune response. The same B cells have to change so that they can move, let's say, into the lung. But when they're in the lung, if they can be in the lung, now the interactions that they have 
will cause them to um, spread antibodies and, and start an effector response to the pathogen. So their identity is different if they're in the spleen or if they're in the bone marrow or if they're in the, if they're in the tissue. And to some degree, you could say the same thing about the cells in your body, all of whom, at least at the genetic level, have a, the same identity or could have potentially the same identity, but their interactions change them. And that's not, to me, that's not the same as operational closure because operational closure is, is, is a lot more, um, um, dominates a lot more by survival, basically. There, there is, of course, a relationship between the two. Um, sorry, I was that, I was maybe, I went on too long. Too long. <laughs> um, so, uh, but did, did I answer your question a little bit at least? Sure. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, so, again, I, I've just said that everything is open, and I start out by saying the brain is closed, or at least it seems closed, which is why it was a good model for Varela to say to use his metaphor, his model, and um, and so again, going back to speech journals, which I just mentioned, I think the brain is, the, is first of all, we know the brain is not actually closed, so the brain. We don't actually we, we don't live in a dualist body. Our body and our brains are all one unit. It's not like a robot with a video camera. It is one thing in our body. And I would say that those interactions are actually more pronounced than Varela gave an account for. But also when we think about the sort of level the emergent level of our minds, um, again I think our minds when if we want to describe how they work, we need to see who they are working with, much like these triangles discussing triangles and how their mind, so their mind, I would say, is this thing, not just the individual thing that's inside each triangle. Um, the second point, though, is that we are not actually, and again, remember that I said cognition is for talking about multicellular organisms. So really the model is not this versus this, it is this versus this. So we are built out of many small autopoietic machines, and much like we don't actually have closure, these cells in our body, these eukaryotic, nearly multicellular organelle things, they are also constantly evolving and developing and don't, in the, don't have a, a strict sense of closure. Um, and what's more, when we think about this interaction, here we should say that they're all interacting with each other. And in fact, most of the signals that you get in the cells in your body come from this interaction this other behaviors of other cells around you, giving you the context, giving them, the cells, the context they need to behave in. And to me, this is the image I like to think about. This is both the frustrating image and uh, because as a biologist, one of the problems is you're trying, I drew this very nice, nearly schematic thing, but the reality is more like this kind of a messy cocktail party in the cantina. And uh, if you want to study biology, it surely doesn't get any better than this. So, um, and so we need to think, and, and the point is that this is not really noise, it's stochasticity that leads to hierarchy and rules, and we need to find out how. And, and now I come to my next problem. I hope at the end I don't completely confuse everybody, but I apologize if I do. So the, po the next problem we have, oh, yes, sorry, Rudolf. Yes, 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 yes. I, I, sorry, just, just yeah. for... Um, just a question concerning this picture of attractors you had before. You uh, this, uh, you sketched, yeah, exactly that one. <clears throat> These attractors, are mm -hmm. there in different dimensions or are they all the same in the so-called here two-dimensional plane and interact via some not shown interaction here? <laughs> or uh, have, oh, you, okay. uh, have you to think them as being, let's say, ortho orthogonal to each other and slightly coupled, coupled or are okay, they... So let, 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 that's great. I, I, I love that question. Nobody has ever asked me that question about this picture, and so uh, thank you. Um, so I, I will say two things, okay? Uh, uh, I, I always think of, 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 of the circles in each, in each loop as being simply uh, the differences of history. So living systems are processes in time, and so at every point in time you have an attractor that is yours because of, again, because I think a lot of what influences behavior, you know, or much of what influences behavior is your own history, regardless of what's happening around you. Mm -hmm. 
And so these are their own attractors. And, and to some degree, I would say that the attractors um, in one are not related to the attractors in another. But but they are the historic, but they are influenced by each other's history. On the other hand, um, we know that this activation can shift your program basically. So I, I will give you an example uh, again from immune cells, um, and this is work done uh, by Phil Hodgkin, who is um, the head of the division in, in Weha in Australia. And basically, he 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 suggested a long time. So when the immune system, and I, I was going to talk about this later, but um, when B cells are activated in an immune response, they um, uh, they start proliferating, and also at the same time, the apoptotic clock is is switched on. And they also mutate to generate this diversity, but also to make sure that if you generate very maladaptive diversity, you die. Because if you don't behave properly, the apoptotic clock will... And so Phil has this amazing model where basically the minute this is triggered, you have two clocks. The cell has two clocks, a death clock and a proliferation clock. And he's shown that the distribution of proliferation and death clocks um, is a, it's, a, it's a distribution across the population. And in fact, there is this, uh, um, cousins have similar clocks, basically. So your children are not directly influenced by your clock, but your grandchildren will th start, to, and, and this, is a, this is a gene expression phenomena that's kind of well known. But here you see it actually influencing the way they behave. Okay? Now, at the same time, um, regardless of what your death clock is doing in terms of its sort of behavior, its, it's you know, signalless behavior, if you get a, a, a save me signal from an antigen presenting cell, then your death clock gets pushed back. Okay? So here you can see a system where, on the one hand, each cell would have this kind of uh, local truth it's trying to get to that is defined by its own characteristics and its history and its parents, basically. And at the same time, these interactions will, to some degree, modify it. And, and you know, a little bit... I would say, you know, that they, in, in psychology, they ask if, if you're influenced by your mother or by your genetics. And my mother-in-law is a psychologist, and she says the answer is always 50-50, no matter what trait you're looking at. So I would say they're not orthogonal, but they have, they have some characteristics that you could say are orthogonal, and some are only influenced by my own history, and some that are influenced by whatever is going on in this other cell. Or, or again, because I also, you know, I, I, I also only do, the, these are only our cells. This is without the, and as if they are only signaling, there's also these other living things that are not our cells. So, but, but I think I, yeah. So yeah. that's my Thank point. you very yeah. Thank you very much. I think. Really, thank you for the question. I, 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 I already see I will have fun coming to the ECLT. Nobody ever asked me that question, ever. I've shown this picture many times. Um, okay, so one of the problems, sorry, I'm jumping to, in studying these kinds of processes is that, um, is the problem of time. Um, and, uh, and we have two problems with time. And uh, I was going to make this animated, but so imagine that you want the first problem in time is that generally we only measure snapshots. So here we have this snapshot. These two dangerous characters are my son and my daughter a few years ago now. They're bigger than that by a lot. And they are standing in an uh, old synagogue um, in one of the towns that wasn't nice to Jesus Christ. And so they, uh, he said that they would get destroyed and they indeed got destroyed. Um, or maybe not because of him, maybe because of an earthquake. Anyway, if you only see this, you cannot tell if afterwards you will have this outcome or this outcome. If the little sister will destroy her brother or he will hug her. So that's one issue of time, that we need to have multiple time points. And if we don't have continuous time, if we can't observe anything, we don't actually know when is the good time point to look. The other problem of time, or of when to know when to look at the process is that they're not all scales are as important. So I'm pretty sure all of you can read this sentence and understand it and see what I think of you. Um, and that's because when we read, we don't need to, uh, um, we don't need to actually see all the scales of the process of the sentence, right? We know how to read. So 
we can, we can see the beautiful people, even though at the scale of syllables, these are completely confused. And the other scale of time is, of course, that I showed you the past, and these are my children now, um, uh, and they are completely different from what they were before. Um, so there are shifts in the now, and again, not always in the same way. So this so snapshot will not give you the uh, complete description of how they behave. Going a little bit further, Again, if I use the metaphor of a story to describe, oh, I'm sorry, um, who, who raised their hand first, Johannes or Rudolf? I don't know. Johannes, you haven't asked the question. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, okay. I have already previously heard about this effect that one can easily detect the cor uh, correct word if, and as a new example, uh, the first and the last letter of each word is correct. Mm -hmm. But that it is a much harder task if it is not the case. Is there any, any progress on the question why there is such a difference? So I don't know. I, 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 afraid I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that it's not always the same in all languages. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the thing that's important um, for reading, for, for be able, being able to do this trick is not the same for all languages. I can tell you, for instance, that in Hebrew, you can do this also in English, actually, but in Hebrew, it's very, very easy to read without any vowels whatsoever. And in fact, most of our spelling is without vowels. So I think yes, I know. Yeah. it's a bit, it a bit depends on, on how the language is translated into words, but um, I don't know. But, but, but I, Rudolf, did you have another question? No, I, it just take it, it does, just doesn't take any force to have to keep your hand ra raised. Ah, I see. Okay. <laughs> see, that's the problem. Um, so, but I wanted to go one step further, and in, in this idea that there are many nows, to sort of show how if we look, if we consider, because again, time is a bit like space and time are a little bit transposed with each other, and if I look. Um, at events that are happening in my body, at the whole level of the body, that's a certain time scale. If I look at evolution, that's a different time scale. And again, if I look at this story, so I wrote these three sentences, and there are actually three stories here, and depending on how you choose when to look, you get a different one. They're all close, but not identical. So if you look only at the, at the red words, you get once upon a time in a city by the sea, there lived a girl every day at the same cafe table waiting. If you if you if you look just at the black letters, you get far far away, all alone in her garret, which is a kind of an attic. She would look out from her kitchen window. And again, if you combine both of them, you get in some sense a more detailed version of the story. But the first two girls, one is sitting in her kitchen looking at a cafe or looking at something, and the other one is sitting in a cafe and and. The difference between them is well is how you space things basically. Now, um, uh, a friend of mine, Uri Hasson at Princeton, he actually showed that this kind of spacing is 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 really important for how we understand stories or how we understand any kind of basically information that is told to us. Um, and what he did in an experiment, he had people uh, read out loud a story a good story um, that was originally told at this uh, kind of open mic story competition called The Moth in New York City. So one person would be in the fMRI and read the story and, uh, and other people would listen to the story. And what he did was some people would listen to the whole story, some people would listen to whole paragraphs but they were mixed inside the story, some people would listen to sentences um, mixed in the story, so the sentences were real, but and some people just words in the mishmash, and he found out two very interesting phenomena. One is that when people understand the story, their brains synchronize with the way that the brain of the person telling the story is behaving in their language areas. So in essence, understanding somebody is synchronizing your brain to their brain. But then, and this is where we come to our time point, the, the, the thing about many nows, what they also found is that you have these different regions 
in your brain that care about different time scales of story. So the red region would sync as long as you had at least words in common. The yellow and green areas would sync as long as you had sentences or paragraphs. And the blue areas would sync only if, if the whole story was told. Okay? So our brain has a mechanism that allows us, and, I, and, and to some degree, I guess we all know we have that mechanism, but it's amazing to be able to actually see it. It, it, it links time scales. Okay? So phenomena all happen at one scale. Individual interactions at one scale then emerge to a higher scale. And you're building on these scales to, to reach the, the highest scales of interaction. But our brain actually knows how to connect these different nows. Um, and in my, I don't know how much longer I have. I don't have any time at all. Okay. But what I will try to do before Akil has to leave is talk about an example of how we try to find a phenomena that also works across many evolutionary scales. Okay? And the idea here is that we follow a process of mutations in a protein landscape at different scales of selection. And we find that serine, which is an amino acid, it has a special encoding that behaves differently than all the other encodings of amino acids. And before I go into it, I would like to mention that the person who really did, you know, as a professor, we don't do anything. So the guy who really did all of the work, all of the grunt work and all, a lot of the thinking was Gregory Schwartz, who when we started this project was a grad student in my lab and who now has his own lab studying cancer at the University of Toronto. So having said that, let's look at the genetic code. Okay? So this is the genetic code. And the genetic code is basically a way of translating triplets of DNA so that you generate certain amino acids and you can put them into a, into a sequence. And it's also a kind of a network, okay? Because if I have a triplet of, of amino acids, T, C, and T, that encode proline, and now I change one of them, then I'm moving to a loop. If I change that T now, well, if I change, sorry, this C to a T, then I will become a leucine. Okay, and if the protein that I had before needed to have a proline, then that leucine will cause that protein to stop working. And evolution depends, and this is an idea of Maynard Smith's, basically depends not so much on getting better, but on not getting catastrophically worse. So that if, if you are in an area where life is possible, then you should be in an area where as many changes as possible don't destroy what already exists. Okay? And the genetic code has actually evolved to maximize that need on as many possible changes as you can, okay? So on the one hand, you need a code that allows you to encode many amino acids, but you also need it to be as stable as possible. And one of the ways that you see that, and I was very excited the first time I noticed it, even though everybody already knew it, is that these changes in this third amino acid don't change amino acid, right? So proline will not change no matter how you encode the third position, and in fact, all amino acids don't change if you change T to C. You see, so T to C, they're all the same. If I have a T or C here, it's the same amino acid. It's the same in all amino acids. And if I change A to G, except for this area with the stop codon and isoleucine, it also is always the same amino acid. And, and that's interesting because these two nucleotides, these mutations are much more likely than mutations across. So serine. Serine is these two amino acids, these two areas of the genetic code. And you can already see that why I say it's special. Because all other amino acids, their codons, there is one way you could mutate them that you don't change every amino acid, right? So proline, if you change the third position, it's the same amino acid. The, you could say that in some, in one direction, all of the codons are adjacent, okay? Not serine. If you went from this serine that is encoded with only two nucleotides, two codons, to this serine that is more stable because it's encoded with four, you would have to, on the way, change into a different amino acid. Okay? So they are disconnected from each other. Now, what we uh, observed... So, sorry. And, 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 and this less stable serine... Um, had already been pointed out as being uh, more prevalent in areas of antibodies that I study that um, 
that change. Whereas this encoding was in more stable areas. And so I had this idea, what if what if it has to do with the kinds of amino acids that they change to, that are close in the in the mutation network here and here. So if I look, so now I've color coded the amino acids based on um, how antibodies are built. And I think there's a reference here, I can't see with all these, yes. And it's from this paper here. And basically the idea is that all of these amino acids, okay, they are hydrophobic and they are inside the structure of the antibody. And all of the red ones are hydrophilic and they're at the edges of the antibody where it interacts with antigens, where it interacts with pathogens. And the middle ones, the white ones, are sort of neutral. Now, you can see that this serin is, it can easily mutate with one mutation of its first position to other neutral amino acids. This serin, okay, is a transition mutation. So if you change T and C here, or if you change A to G, which is again also a transition mutation, between these two positions, so in the second base you change A to G, or in the, in the first position, you get these four amino acids that I've marked here in red. And the reason I marked them in red is because these four amino acids are very good at making better turns. Better turns are kind of uh, sharp edges for a protein, and they would be very good. It's a very good shape to have if you want to be in contact with things. Okay? So it makes sense to think of this as... as um, so if these are the four amino acids... So what we did, sorry, we, we, we looked, okay, again, at the highest scale that we could of evolution. So we took 99 vertebrate genomes, including Homo sapiens, and looked at all of their genes, and we built what is known as a blossom table, meaning we characterized what is the, how surprising is it that you get a certain kind of amino acid change across all of these genes. And we looked specifically at these two areas. Okay? At these four amino acids, sort of that don't really change the characteristics of the amino acid like serin, and at these four amino acids that all have better turns but very different characteristics. And you can see we organized the amino acids by their characteristics. So these, you see here, F, L, I, M, V, these are all the hydrophobic amino acids. And you can see they, they are more pink, less blue, they are more likely to change into each other than to anything else. Okay? And then in this serine, you see, it also is more likely to change into these guys. But the other serine, you can see by the positive values, is, as opposed to this, this serine, right, is more likely to change into this transition neighborhood of better turn amino acids. So we see that... Um, they have different neighborhoods. Now, the other thing I should mention is, you see the arrows? Usually in the Blossom table, that's actually our addition, you wouldn't add this extra position here. And so, this arrow goes up if the likelihood of, of, of change is higher compared to the table I would have had without this line, and, it's, and it goes down if it's less. Okay? And a circle means that it used to be negative, but is now positive. Now, um, <clears throat> and, and you can see it, right? Because if I go from this serine to glycine, it's negative. But if I go from this serine to glycine, it's actually a, a positive, meaning that it's twofold more than expected. Okay? So, one of the possibilities is that it's just the, the fact of adding more information. Because I have another place to look, I get more exact results. But in fact, if I add another position for leucine, because leucine also has another extra two codons, you see the information doesn't change at all. Leucine is always stuck in the same neighborhood of things it can change to, both of them. So serine is special, and it's not special by itself, it's basically describing two neighborhoods of mutation that are special across species. Okay, so there's this neighborhood, that has the more uh, the more constant serine and this neighborhood this area
and they are the, and, and they are separated not by the characteristics of the amino acid, but by where you started from in your genome. Okay, this is a very unique concept because usually when we think of selection, we think only of characteristics of amino acids, not about how they're encoded in the genome. And here we see an example where in fact the genetic code gives you two spaces for this amino acid so that you can uh, maximize the kinds of functions that you have. And so we had a hypothesis that these, the, the less, the less um, uh, stable serin and the better turn amino acids would be preferred in positions that diversity is permissible, whereas the more conserved serin and, and the neutral amino acids would be prevalent in positions that needed to be conserved. And how do we decide where to look? Because lots of positions just don't need any of them. So we went across all of the positions in the genome and only looked at those positions where if we checked the diversity of amino acids, serine was one of the important amino acids. And I'm going a little bit quickly because of time. But, and then what we did is we checked if there is a correlation between how often you use GSND in those positions and how conserved those positions are, or rather how diverse they are, and we found a positive correlation. And then we checked if there's a negative correlation of diversity and how often you use these amino acids. And in both cases, with significant results, we saw a positive selection for this. So diversity correlates with the use of these four amino acids and reverse correlates with the use of these amino acids. And another way you can see the same thing is if we look, so this is the top quartile of diverse positions and how much they use these four amino acids, the distribution of how much they use these amino acids, and this is how much they use, this is at the bottom quartile, and how much they use these four amino acids. At the same time, we look at the top quartile, how much they use these four amino acids, and the bottom quartile. And you can see quite clearly, the top quartile uses much more GSMD than the bottom quartile, and at the same time, the bottom quartile lot uses a lot more of these neutral amino acids than the bottom quartile. So, Clearly, there is a relationship. Diverse positions, diversifying positions prefer these amino acids. Now, we wanted to look at another case. We, had an, we found another example where this serine, the diversifying serine, uh, is again found more often in places that can diversify. And so this was done by this student of Michal Linials, um, Tair Shauli, and what she did Again, this is a different scale of selection. We were looking across all species. She took the exact, the, 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 the population polymorphism database of all human exons, and we looked at what is the likelihood of, of shifting an amino acid given the mutation patterns of silent mutations. And then we asked, how often do we see a mutation that's more or less than expected? And when we look at not phosphorylated, um, sorry, I, I should say this, you see these four amino acids, these are the four amino acids that can get phosphorylated, and serine again has two positions in the network, the, the diversifying one and the conserved one, okay? And when you look at this network, gray lines means behaving as expected by mutation patterns. Blue lines means less than expected by mutation, and red lines means more than expected by mutation. Okay, and what you can see is not phosphorylated. All of these, most if not all of these, amino, of these amino acid changes happen at the when we look at across all the human population are basically happening like neutral mutation, which is more or less what you would expect. If you look at all the genes and all the amino acids, and there's nothing that you are thinking about being selected, then it looks like a mutation because sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. When we look at those positions where these amino acids are phosphorylated, you can see that this serine, the more conserved serine, cannot mutate to the two positions that are one away from it, okay? It mutates to them less than expected. It has a blue line. On the other hand, this less conserved serine, this more diversifying serine, mutates back and forth from the threonine like mutation, basically, uh, it can go back and forth as much as it likes. What's also interesting is that this trionine doesn't, uh, it's not uh, symmetrical. This trionine can go back to both serines at this position. 
the position that is conserved and is encoded by this serine is it, this is what is important basically so you again see if you have a phosphorylation site that needs to be conserved it will be encoded with this serine the four codons oops and if it's more diversifiable it will be encoded with this and then it can go back and forth from threonin what you can see also is that this in a way protects it i guess from moving to uh, tyrosine so I have a little bit more, but I don't know. I have like one more way. I, I want to, well, okay. So, um, so again, we see this at different scales of selection, this phenomena of, of two, um, of two, two, two patterns for serin. And the last way I wanted to show it to you is again, finally to talk about the immune system. Um, because again, like I said in the beginning, in the immune system, we can actually look at two scales. We can first of all see how our immune system evolves between people. And also we can look at how an immune response, the history of immune responses in a person. And what do I mean by that? So we, the way that diversity is generated in B cells is that we have these genes that have many, many segments. And only in B cells, each B cell selects one of these segments and so you have a unique receptor. This unique receptor has to be, be tested for efficacy because you made it randomly. And if it works, it will go out into the periphery. And so every, it proliferates and goes. So all of these green cells had the same kind of receptor, okay? And now when there's an immune response, they start proliferating and competing and mutating. So now instead of three families of each with its own unique receptor, we have three families of unique mutants, some of which are related. So all of these blue cells are related and had the same mother cell. All of these red cells had the same mother cell. Okay, so I can now look at two levels of change. One is how things mutated from the original germline. And the other one is what is the population of germlines that you have. Okay, because each person is different in terms of what segments they have. And looking at, a, again, at, at, I think it was more than 30 people from across the globe, including some people from Papua New Guinea, which was very special because usually when we study immune systems, they are... I'm bad. I, I apologize, Akil. Yes. Um, so, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I mean, I mean uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we will have uh, many things to decide. This, this stuff is very interesting to me. So, you know, as soon as you okay. get uh, here, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, we will have okay. a, a nice discussion. I, but I, I, I yeah, I, I should have been better with time. I am. Uh, sorry, I have to leave. Uh, but uh, I leave you in good hands. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. No, thank you. Uh, so, so, um, so here we, again, we see, so if before we, sh we saw the hypothetical kinds of changes you see when you compare lots of uh, uh, evolved species. Here we are actually seeing um, this is the source amino acid that we know was in that sequence before it became a mutant because we can uh, bioinformatically assign the closest neighbor. And this is what it actually mutated to. Okay. And you can see that um, uh, again, these amino acids mutate to the hydrophobic. This serine stays with its neutral amino acid uh, cohort, and these mutate inside uh, the, uh, the the the, um, the um, transition neighborhood of the beta turns. Now, what's interesting is we can even uh, sort of artificially subdivide things even more because I can look across the clones, across these families, and ask at different positions. So these are positions in the sequence. I can ask which amino acids did you use that didn't mutate, and which amino acids did you use that did mutate. So I can see both the evolution of humans and the somatic selection during a lifetime. And again, and, and here, sorry, the red positions are those positions that diversify more in the B-cell receptor, and the black positions are the ones that don't. And you can see that um, the red positions all have lots of G and the less the less uh, the less conserved serine in both cases. 
And again, I won't go into this. There's a the way we did the statistical analysis had to take into account that we look only at different people. I'll just get to the sort of you can see that it is very statistical. So if I look at how each individual person behaves, and if they consistently behave in one direction, I I say that the CDR GSMD is more than the framework. So comparing the diverse to the conserved, and you can see that in the germline, the genes that evolve across humans, um, it's very consistently these four are in the CDR and these four are in the framework. Okay. And when you look at mutations during a lifetime, in fact, you so seldom see mutations in these kinds of amino acids that you can only check if these amino acids, sorry, these four stay like that. And you can see that they do. So most of the, of the substitutions from these four amino acids maintain these four and do not shift um, to these four or to any other. So again, we've added two other scales where we see that again, the genetic code, the way it's evolved is actually uh, beneficial for transitions across essentially all scales of, of selection and evolution that we can think of from something that happens during the lifetime of a person all the way to the selection across uh, species. So, yeah, I guess I, I, I can missed the last uh, two slides. So sort of the summary of the themes I hope I got to cover, but maybe we will talk about them more uh, next time. I um, uh, why can't I see anybody anymore? I seem to have. Um, what did I do? Ah, you're here. We're here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. Yeah. I, I put you. I put you all the way down. Um, so, living systems are processes. In individual interactions, how, uh, and these processes are the result of individual interactions that lead to emergent systems. But sometimes, at, at different scales. What is the system and what is the individual can change. There is no real, there's no ultimate closure, only stable attractors. And multiple scales of interaction imply multiple nows. And finally, as I hope I showed you with my work here, if we follow examples in context, we can f still, despite all of this lack of stability, we can find uh, consistent rules that work across multiple scales. And um, Again, I, I thought I would also add this slide, which is like future questions and things that I'm thinking about and I would love to discuss when we are finally actually in the same place, which is, so I've talked a lot about conversations and, and so I wonder what is the basis of cellular conversations? What are the building blocks, the molecular building blocks? Um, how does uh, complexity, all of this complexity begets stability? This room is not actually as chaotic as it seems. And finally, what are the consequences of new metaphors of immunity and microbial pathogenesis, both in how we understand the biology, but also in how we describe it to uh, other people? And Rudolf, you had a question, or is it still... Uh... Uh, no, no, I have actually a number of questions, but please finish finish your talk. Okay, so my, so my last bit is just, again, I know I'm going to come to visit you, but if you or any of your students are interested in any of these things and would like to come to Haifa, um, I'm always very happy to have guests in Haifa. This is a um, this is the view from Haifa University is on top of the Carmel Mountain. This is the view from the mountain, and this is actually the view from my lab. I I, I should I, I I don't know I, I don't know how you guys are, but as a computational biologist, I spent a lot of my career in basements, so I'm very proud of the lab and this view that we have, and this is the lab itself. Um, so again, so that that's the end of my talk, I think. Thank you very much. So yeah, so if you had questions, so now is the time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I actually, I do not see uh, whether somebody else raised his or her hand, but uh, if you allow, I would like to start. Yes, please. Uh, I'm fascinated by your uh, metaphor or picture of, attract of attractors, but uh, when this begs at least two types of questions to me. The first one is, can we somehow quantify that such that we can, can translate this knowledge into, let's say, also therapeutic measures? What I concretely think about is that in dynamical systems, you, quite, you usually have also, if you set up a system, you quite often also have spurious attractors. And in your picture, it's at least uh, conceivable, also it's only a hypothesis, but it's conceivable that 
an autoimmune disease is uh, the situation where somebody falls into sort of a spurious attractor. And then if we could quantify a little bit better these attractors, we probably just using more or less tools from control theory, we could think about uh, uh, efficient ways of how to bring somebody back into the right attractor. Or, or is that too, uh, too simply, uh, too simple? No, no, I, I think, I think, um, I think that, that uh, and in fact, uh, Irun Cohen, who was my supervisor, he had a, so he had an attempt of something like that, um, not, I, and his models, I think, were not even that um, sophisticated, but he, he, he made an attempt of something like that. Ba basically, the idea that he had, and, and I think now maybe we would think of more complicated ideas, but at the time, one of the ideas was this uh, sort of idiotypic networks. So there was an idea that uh, when you have an, a receptor that binds to a certain antigen, some of the receptors, um, this receptor, and it's, uh, sorry, I'm just, um, is also some other receptors an antigen. So you could have networks of receptors that are actually uh, keeping each other in check. Yep. And, and this theory was very, very popular amongst uh, sort of physicists who like to make models but ended up not maybe being quite real, um, at least not at the level that they sort of imagined it. But uh, it was, a, there is apparently some crosstalk between some kinds of receptors, and, uh, and, and, and I can try to send you the paper of what they did, but um, basically they discovered um, a series of, 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 of receptors that bind to uh, chaperones. So they bind to stress response oh, yeah. proteins, and um, they showed, and also I actually that was part of my PhD project, that these could actually be the building blocks on which the whole T cell repertoire is uh, focused. And in mice, they actually managed to reverse, um, not to block, but also to reverse, uh, 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 um, uh, what's it called? Um, the diabetic phenotype of the, you know, of the, the autoimmune disease diabetes. Mm -hmm. By giving them, by basically recalibrating the re the, the population of T cells that respond to this chaperone, um, the the only and, and it actually nearly became a drug, except that in humans it didn't work. We don't know why that specific thing didn't work. Um, but I think the concept is is definitely uh, sound. I think that now possibly we could we could look at things uh, even like sort of single cell experiments to see. Um, but basically what what happens is that uh, <clears throat> when we see an autoimmune disease or when we don't see an autoimmune disease it's because we can uh, it's we're looking at the bulk population but at any given time when you have an autoimmune disease when you don't have an autoimmune disease you still do have cells that are auto uh, reactive even maybe to those same antigens they're just controlled and when you have an autoimmune disease you also have cells that are not and I think if we if we um, if it, it it's an interesting I think idea to think about how to um, how to design the experiment on which populations, but I, I I think that it could be done. But we, the the problem is to find the right population to look at and to be able to describe the the building blocks of diversity basically to, of of the cells of the set points of where individual cells are going to, and then to see how you can get a situation where. Um, instead of multiple cells pushing each other to stay not autoreactive, suddenly the checks and balances are gone and you're actually being pushed autocatalytically to become more population of autoreactive cells. It's a, a similar problem is also, I think, you know, when, um, when you have uh, sepsis or when you have, uh, at, when, when people who are older, they have more cancer or they have, uh, um, uh, I've forgotten the name now, uh, senescence, senescence of cells. You, yeah. you reach a stage where the cells, instead of fixing each other, are actually uh, poisoning each other with their own death signal. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but now uh, Johannes also had a question, and then John. Okay, uh, first of all, to Tara Pa for your very interesting talk. Okay, and sure. I have two questions. The first one regards yeah. the picture of the brain you showed us, which areas are responsible for the short time uh, response and for the intermediate times and for the long times. Mm -hmm. And if I have seen it correctly, 
fan of a part which is responsible for detecting the meaning of short uh, times is enclosed within the area for the intermediate times and that one is again enclosed in the area of the long times. Is this impression correct? Yes, I think so. I, and and I, I think it is. And I think um, uh, also what you could say is that um, I think uh, if you only color coded one of them, it would include it, I think even. Mm -hmm. Right? It would have to because you can't get to the long times without also doing the short times. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I also wanted uh, to know, uh, do you also know about uh, what uh, the brain looks like for less evolved animals, like for example, flies, who are said uh, to have only a short time span of concentration, do they miss these other parts? So, 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 times? so first of all, um, you know, flies don't have a cortex, okay. so they definitely are missing these parts. Um, but I think, I, I, I personally think that um, we are a little bit too in, in love with these parts that we have and that uh, uh, other animals that have other parts, um, so again, I, I think we are very good at abstraction and, and combining timescales and probably the best of all brains, maybe dolphins, I don't know, but uh, or elephants, but... Um, but uh, but I think we are not um, as special as we would like to think. So you can so for instance, crows um, can do very complicated um, multi-stage planning to, to achieve things mm -hmm. and definitely play games. And they're birds; they have no cortex either. Mm -hmm. And even uh, bees, people have done experiments with bees showing that you can do operant conditioning uh, with bees in the sense, you know, like a Y maze. So there's a maze that has a picture and then they go in and inside there is a second picture and based on the first picture they have to decide what to do with the second picture. Mm -hmm. And even bees can learn how to do that. And they have nothing. And again, I'm not even talking about octopuses who have very strange brains and are very, very um, capable of doing many things and remembering many things. So I, I think, um, so flies obviously don't, they don't have a cortex so they wouldn't have that region. I have to imagine that um, that uh, maybe not quite as many levels of time as in humans, uh, but uh, that they have to have a region that will allow them to uh, sift uh, context and time uh, beyond the immediate. Uh, I don't know what the structures are, and I and I and I think th there is also like some things that are easier if you can. So. Um, Uri Hasson, who, who wrote that paper and who is has this very cool lab at uh, Princeton, is very good at at inventing experiments to answer these kinds of questions. I think it's also easier for us to deal with this kind of time scale when we're studying somebody who can actually speak, mm -hmm. because then there is a thing to talk about. Um, it's it's harder to make abstract examples without speech. But, um, but yeah, anyway, I, I think, um, so, so, I, so I don't think flies have it and I don't know what it is, but I'm sure that maybe not flies, but slightly more, um, complicatedly behaving animals have regions like that, even if not necessarily where we have them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have an other question regarding an other topic. Yeah. You showed us these matrices about Soren and, uh, how, uh, the values change uh, when you uh, uh, change uh, different uh, um, bases. Mm -hmm. uh, the question for me is, when I look closely at these figures you showed us, uh, then it seems to me that they are a little bit related to this uh, work of Giorgio Parisi, who um, introduced... Um, the approach of iterated replica symmetry breaking, in which he has also some large overlap values in blocks along the diagonal of his matrix and smaller uh, values mm. on the outside. So okay. would you think that uh, also in your system this has something to do, that nature has somehow uh, to deal 
with various optima in the energy landscape and that there are some frustration effects which are occurring in this system. I, I don't know. I, I have now you've given me something to look up and check. I, I don't know. I, I, again, it makes it makes sense to me that there definitely is. So a little bit. I, I didn't say this accurately enough and I'm not enough of a, a, a protein folding specialist, but uh, but I, I, I think that's definitely part of it. And I think the idea here is that um, serine, this amino acid, mm -hmm. is uh, is participating in more than one, well, all of them are participating in more than one kind of structure. Mm -hmm. And I think serine is, 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 has enough of a role in two very different structures that it actually gets encoded twice. Um, the rest of the structure of it, again, I, I think, I, I didn't talk about this at all, but um, all of the examples I showed uh, were purposefully of proteins, or, or in the case of the antibodies, responses, not for something specific. So it gives you the, the common ground the, the most general common ground that doesn't lead to disastrous change. There is also another place where, let's say, if I was looking at the evolution of antibodies that respond to influenza or to the spike protein in COVID, okay, then I, which which is hard to do because we don't have enough data and it's it's there's different other other problems. But there, I imagine that maybe it wouldn't look so clean because maybe sometimes. There is a combination of positions that is just, even though it doesn't make sense in terms of the evolved genetic code, mm -hmm. makes a shape that's good. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I basically I need to, I need to read this paper. I, I don't know, but I, but it makes sense. What the way you described it, it makes sense that it is related. I, I need to look at it. I will say one other thing, which is that um, I, I. Um, um, this order of amino acids mm -hmm. is not is not is all. I mean, I, I chose it. Um, I didn't cluster anything, and it's not alphabetical or anything. It's basically I took the genetic code, and I made us. Uh, I went like this. Yes. And 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 the, the point of it is also a little bit my point, which is that the genetic code is organized. It has regions. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's exactly what one sees in your. Uh, matrix here with these blocks which you yes. have already marked and yeah. because of that I asked this for no, so, but I, but I, I, I think I, I've never managed to completely characterize um, physically like or chemically really precisely what the blocks are beyond these general descriptions that I gave you mm -hmm. it will be interesting to look at this paper and see maybe maybe it is possible to characterize them more um, um, accurately Anyway, so so John, you had a question. No, you're muted. You're muted, so I can't hear. Sorry. In the meantime, I have a whole half a dozen, but let, let me just be. I make a few comments, and then you can choose what to respond to. Okay. Um, uh, well, they're, they're all in the form of sort of questions. Um, concerning your last point, uh, the um, uh, the since the work of. Uh, many people on the origin of the genetic code, mm. uh, which I also participated but, uh, with a colleague, Peter Wills, who did a bit more. Uh, we know uh, the latest from the work of Rosemary Swanson uh, mm. of the uh, uh, relationship between distance in terms of numbers of mutations and physical properties of the amino acid. And there's been quite a lot of work associated with that. Uh, and back at the end of the... Um, 80s, uh, I and many other people, I think, had the idea that there was a relationship between the neural self-organizing feature maps, which mm -hmm. uh, organize uh, neighboring uh, receptors in the visual field to be located at neighboring locations in the brain. And this topology mapping applies mm -hmm. to many different uh, uh, situations, including the genetic code. Uh, mm. And and uh, so there there are I think there's quite a big literature on the, on understanding the genetic code with respect to these things that uh, uh, might uh, be interesting. Uh, uh, there's a concrete paper which I imagine that you know 
uh, uh, Sidney Brenner uh, on the tale of two uh, serenes, in particular expanding on uh, the uh, relationship between the two different uh, serene encodings. And he comes to the conclusion that the the origin of this is associated with uh, uh, convergent evolution from threonine and cysteine, uh, but that still could be uh, uh, compatible with your type of explanation for the functional reason for maintaining these uh, two different uh, coding uh, mm -hmm. sections. But uh, just before I, I, I let you answer, I, I had one other sort of main point, which, which is more where I'm less certain uh, about what's going on. Um, in connection with your long time axis story, uh -huh. um, I, I'm, I would be curious to talk with you at some point, uh, maybe you have a quick response about uh, the role of the maternal immune system and uh, the transition from, uh, because it, it, the immune system is also a bit different from other systems in that the embryo doesn't uh, uh, develop it from scratch from its own genes, but it's a sort of process of uh, uh, alteration from the maternal immune system, if I understand things correctly. And I'm wondering mm. how, how this, uh, 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 how this, uh, whether this, uh, a lot of the things that you're talking about at different timescales could be investigated in, in relationship to uh, uh, embryo versus uh, uh, individual uh, responses. So, so anyway, th those are three different lines where you can choose something to talk about if you want to, to answer the most interesting. So, so your comment about CERN, I, I'm ashamed to say that I, I don't know, I don't know Sidney Bueno's paper and I need to read it now and I just googled it and I will read it at once and tell you what I think. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, and I have an apology about that, which is that I, I, I started out as a neurobiologist and a psych like I, I have a BA in biology and, and, and psychology and I, I thought I would be a brain scientist of some kind and I was really interested in adaptive systems and adaptive mo and I became a theoretician and and Ewan Cohen and Mark, two, two different people made me an immunologist and um, and a B-cell immunologist to boot and and it's only when I came to B-cells that I sort of discovered mutations and serine and serine was again pinpointed as being special in the, in the immune system by Michael Neuberger from Cambridge. And so his paper was the one that got me interested in CERN, not Sydney Buenos. Um, and I, um, so I'll, I'll, I have to look it up and I'll tell you what I think. But um, okay. I actually have heard some, Mike Levitt, I don't know if he's, mm -hmm. sort of talking about arginine and serine maybe being some of the first amino acids in terms of, of like encoded and, and encoded in many more positions, maybe even. So like if you think about, like you can go from a two position genetic code to a three to like, why do we have three and not less like go? And, and that potentially it's sort of left over from being even more redundantly encoded as serine just for being so useful. Um, but that so sort of serine and arginine, both are very useful amino acids. Um, but I, I don't, I, I'm really not a structural biologist, which is maybe a problem. Um, and also I want to say there are a lot of very cool mathematical papers, not all of which I completely understand, talking about the genetic code and how it sort of is kind of a, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a tetrahedral kind of structure and like this, mm -hmm. and, and then how each, each, each region is basically a characteristic and you can sort of swing them around. It, it's, at the end, but all of them though summarized in my head to being, it's super evolved. I don't know exactly, like it's really not random. And then one of the amazing things there to me is that mitochondria often have different genetic codes. Which, again, I, I don't know, maybe this doesn't surprise, maybe you knew this, all, but I, I don't know, like I feel like I was taught in biology that there was only one genetic code, even the care mostly have the same genetic code. And then you find out that even inside our, the human, like the human mitochondria actually has a different genetic code. It's not very different, but it's different. Um, anyway, well, the first person I, I know who talked about uh, another facet of your talk, uh, I mean, about an aspect related to another facet of your talk, uh, namely the difference between um, uh, uh, permissive sort of environments for mutations and non-permissive ones, conservative and non-conservative mm -hmm. ones, um, was in connection with uh, Manfred Eigen's uh, 
quasi-species model, which obviously mm -hmm. has been also applied to um, mm -hmm. uh, virology and hence also to uh, antigen sort of development. Um, and and there, there were the first papers I know quantitatively looking at whether or not a, the selection of the central um, most common mutant uh, could be biased by the selection of the mutants the fitness of the around of the surrounding mutants around it and that sort of somewhat reminiscent of your two serine environments in some sense so that, um, that 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 part is 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 um i think a field that is getting um right now single cell biology and all the sequencing we're doing with microbes um is i think really advancing those kinds of ideas because you can actually see that um there are stable populations where you're not the fit they're not the fittest in any like even if you want, if you can decide what fittest is, they are not the fittest. They are just, um, and they can reach fittest quite easily. But they're actually what what the, where they're staying is a place where it's not so easy for them to die off from change. Mm -hmm. yeah. That and that's definitely been like I've, I've seen a few papers like that recently. But to go back to your comment about mothers and immune systems, mm -hmm. so I don't think that's how it works. Okay, and I and and I and I have to say that from what I know. Mm -hmm you inherit your mother's antibodies that she generated. And so for a while, while your immune system is still very naive, um, you have this extra immune system that is helping you survive, but you do not inherit anything um, genetic, like other than, you know, half your chromosome, but you don't really inherit um, memory cells. You don't inherit... Um, um, definitely, you definitely don't. Definitely, there's no back talk between the repertoire and the gam the gametes. So you get what you get. Um, but isn't it like this set, this arrow that you were talking about? This which we sort of had an early the first question about yeah. whether that exists. That the mother's antibodies uh, it, uh, sort of to change who uh, the environment that you're that the immune system is developing in. Otherwise, the newly born individual will suddenly have to develop autoimmunity, uh, lack of uh, immune response to all of its own cell situations simultaneously right at the beginning. It'll be almost an impossible task. No, to, so, to so, the thing is, the, so I, I would say that it's not as impossible because you can actually and that's the part I didn't really get to talk about because I was so slow talking about other things. But if you um here I can, I can actually go back to it though if if you uh, um so it, there's really two stages in the repertoire's development and the first one is the stage where the naive repertoire is formed and at this stage you, you generate this huge diversity from all these segments but then uh, to have a functional b cell and it's kind of the same for the other population for t cells but it, it has to have it has to pass um, three tasks. It has to be um, something that you can actually um, uh, put on a membrane. It, it, it's a heterodimer, so both of these, the heavy chain and the light chain, have to actually be able to interact with each other. And then finally, this area at the end, which is the variable region, is actually tested for functionality. Okay? So all of these receptors um, are to some degree autoreactive, okay? They're not, if, they be, if they're super autoreactive, then they are either uh, killed off or a subset of them actually become some kind of autoimmunity police because the kind of, the, 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 the phenotype is much shifted, but if, and, and, and in fact, like if they're activated, then they cause energy, they, they cause down regulation of immune responses, okay? But, it's not the case that the baby or, you know, the, the initial immune system has to suddenly um, very rapidly learn not to react to the body. It, it's the same as ever. Like, it, it has to form what you're missing, and that's why, you know, small children are very sick for five years, basically, is you have no memory response to anything. Everything is new. So anything that infects you and manages to pass the innate immune system gets you sick. And so we get sick a lot, and then we stop getting sick. And in fact, you could think that maybe that's like purposeful because it's also like, you know, human young person's behaviors are actually worse for that than like we also don't get sick as adults because we're just not crawling on the floor, sticking our fingers and everything and in our mouths. But um, 
doesn't sorry I, I don't want to go on too long at this but yeah. just one central point that I that I don't quite understand that in the in the womb uh, yeah. the uh, the you, the embryo is subjected to uh, the mother's antigens and antibodies to a large extent right no 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 so no? so one of the things that allows a womb to exist is that you have a you have a, 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 it's an, I think it's a single cell membrane around the placenta of, of, oh, of, of, so of the T cells that usually the role okay. is to actually kill things, but these ones somehow the program is shifted and what they do is keep the baby from killing the mother and the mother from killing the baby. Mm-hmm. And they actually, uh, they actually are using genes that we, th- the, the theory is that those are um, retroviral genes that somehow went into the, like we got a cassette Somehow, uh, at some point in mammalian evolution, we acquire the cassette of viral genes that are um, that block immune immune responses. Basically, now what's amazing about that is that sometimes, despite that, after birth, a mother can have a chimeric set of cells from her child, and she lives fine with them, unless she gives birth again to a child that's too similar to the previous child, and then that child usually gets aborted. And then, and then, and the other thing here is that what can still go through, because I guess it's not considered a cell, so it's not self. I, I, I don't really understand why, but babies do definitely get in their own blood system the antibodies of the mother, no cells. If they get cells, then something is going wrong, and probably that is not going to be a viable, viable embryo. Um, there is again, there's a guy called um, Steel. I forget his first name who really wants to say that we somehow inject um, some of the genes of really good clones into the gametes, but I think that's not real. Uh, th- that's so Lamarckian that I don't even understand how we would have a... What, one of the reasons why we have... If you look at the genome of, the, of B cells, and I, I really didn't talk about that, but it's something that we've done a lot of, you can see that it's amazing, like you have this phenomena of conservation of diversifying areas. And they're diversifying not just in terms of which amino acids you have, they're diversifying in terms of how they attract mutations. So they actually are hot. They, 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 once the mutator gets on, they will mutate more. Now, if these things were actually being um, were part of sort of our... Con- if these things didn't die with you, basically, then after a few generations, they would disappear, right? Because you would attract mutations, they would evolve, they would stop being able to attract mutations because they did. And you wouldn't have these amazing diversifying regions. So a lot of the tricks the immune system uses are dependent on us having, on that being a somatic system, not an evolutionary system. Mm -hmm. And I think you can learn about that also from the brain. I think that our brains also, like all of these systems, I I think, but I I learned from that is that they are actually, um, if the way to generate an adaptive system is, is basically to have it die off after a while. Like it learns, it becomes more strict, more whatever, more rigid, and then new ones come along. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I got philosophical again. Um, I'm sure if Achilles was here, he'd sort of take over a host role, and uh, I would have uh, long since uh, uh, moved the discussion on. But uh, yeah. uh, I don't know, whether, Rudy, are you adopting that role now for, for us? <laughs> Well, actually, I can jump into that, but um, um, yeah, uh, see, there, th- that's such an interesting discussion, an ongoing discussion, and I'm, I'm very happy that you will stay at ECLT because I think that uh, Johannes, but also another uh, colleague of mine who is not here, who actually now models the immune system with, he- with the help of perceptrons, um, wow. could be very interested in, in discussions with you. So I'm really looking forward to that because I think nowadays we learn more and more about the immune system and also about the fact that it is truly an information processing system, an information processing system of which I hope we will uh, at one time have the possibility not only to notch it, but to actively communicate with it. And and therefore, I think your metaphor building is absolutely helpful and whether or not mRNA technologies will open up a channel or not, we will see. But uh, at least yeah. we, we are permanently developing new tools. And so I'm, I'm really happy. 
to have you at the ECLT. Are there mm -hmm. further questions? First, I do not want to interrupt this very... No, 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 no. Are there other questions? No, I think everybody's... At the moment, it seems like it's just the two of us and other people who are being John, polite. John, you are highly invited to go on with your uh. questions. Otherwise, I, I, I have another one. <laughs> okay, okay, I, 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 I have nowhere to go. My question is about, you said that, of course, uh, let's say our behavior to some extent trivially influences our immune system because depending on our behavior, we come into contact with uh, different types mm -hmm. of exposures. Now, do you think it, I dare to ask this question, do you think it possible that the immune system also that this is again a loop in the sense that our info, that our immune system not only directly but somehow also indirectly starts to influence our behavior and so, therefore sets up a protection in the, so to speak indirectly i ask this question particularly with some eye on john because john made a very interesting paper or, or draft or, or whatever you have to talk about that about careful and less careful people in in, a, in the case of pandemics. Ah. And I think these, these are very interesting thoughts. So, okay. So I, I have to wait. Uh, um, so first of all, I mean, there's the obvious ways, right? So when you get really sick, you your behavior changes. And that's yeah. all because of the immune system. And and also beyond that, we know that there is a, um, through the vagus nerve, there is a lot of crosstalk between uh, the immune system and the central nervous system. And okay. what's interesting to me about it is that it's a, and again, I don't know, I always wondered if this is like, like an engineering principle. It, it goes, um, when the brain is signaling to the immune system, it uses neurotransmitters even in the immune system. So acetylcholine mm -hmm. actually influences activation of, of, uh, of the production of TNF and activation of immune cells. And when it goes back up, um, it, immune cells, there are interleukin-1 receptors in the vagus nerve. Interleukin-1 is one of the best uh, sort of pro-inflammation cytokines. They can't go to the blood-brain barrier, they're too big. But inside the brain, at the other side of the vagus nerve, it actually produces interleukin-1 and signals all kinds of neurons, which again, generate a lot of this sort of, you know, like, uh, basically, right, we, we we feel like crap, our temperature goes up, or even if it doesn't, we stay in bed and we don't want to talk to anybody. That's, the immune system is doing that to us. It's not a... Uh... Now, I, I think, beyond that, I, I, I think, um, and there is a, there is a, you know, there are a lot of, um, what's it called? Um, uh, I've forgotten the word now. How do you call it? Uh, no, placebo, kind of like placebo effects, okay? Which, in which the brain affects our behavior, our, our well-being or, you know, like, and there is a very interesting woman called Asia Rolls at the Technion here in Israel who studies them quantifiably and has shown amazing things about how uh, different levels of stress can, uh, or even perceived stress or lack of perceived stress can influence a lot of health and health outcomes. Um, and there are other people who have been studying, you, you know, like, it seems like one of the reasons that homeopathy works at all is because doctors and who, people who practice that kind of witch medicine uh, ask people how they're feeling. You know, they behave like doctors used to behave. They don't just list things, they actually talk to them about getting well. And that helps people. So I I, I know that's not maybe exactly what you meant. I, I think so. The, the immune cells definitely activate the brain and activate the neurons. There are clear neuronal communications with immune cells. Um, and, and there's a lot that we don't quite know yet about um, how that could interfere or encourage inflammation. Um, I don't think that uh, I, if I had to make a model of why people behave 
safely or not, I, 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 I would put it more in immunology than in the immune system, just because, I don't know, I, I, it would be hard for me to know how the feedback would work. But, um, but there's definitely communication between the two systems. They are not, they are not separate systems. They are both, um, I actually had a, a paper, I think the immune system is, one way to think about the immune system is that it is the body's perceptual system for dealing with molecular information. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I fully agree with that perspective. And, and, and I, so, it, it deals with the, the thing is though, that some of those things have a time scale of, of response that doesn't require the brain. So they don't bother to, they don't bother with the brain, but, um, uh, but yeah. I, I would be, hi, I would sorry. be highly. Yeah, sorry, Rudy. J just brief answer, yeah. uh, if you allow. Well, I would be highly interested in that paper because uh, I'm not so in the in the uh, homo homeopathy and astrology and no. whatever edge, but but man, I fully agree with your point of view that the immune system actually knows on a molecular basis what ha happens, whereas the neural, the, 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 the nervous system knows where it happens. And we also have certain information via the sort of pain that we experience. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the term engineering. And from an engineering perspective, even if I don't know how, but from an engineering perspective, it makes complete sense to merge these two types of information. Mm -hmm. No, so and I like it. I think that especially when it comes to inflammation and wound healing, yeah. uh, there yeah. is a relationship between the two things. Again, I mentioned homeopathy in a negative way, so I don't... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, okay. So please, John, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks for triggering this stuff. The unpublished work that we've done on the relationship with uh, between caution uh, as part of the uh, uh, essentially pandemic population response. So we didn't construct any model about how caution arises in people uh, and we didn't even suggest that uh, there might be some uh, uh, additional mechanism apart from the brain's perceived uh, mm -hmm. uh, perception of caution, risk of death. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, related to the immune story, but, uh, uh, but we did construct uh, some modeling of uh, how uh, you could include human caution and the degree of caution in a population dynamics model directly to explain a lot of both governmental and individual responses and how the the uh, pandemic has unfolded, including the multiple waves and uh, and various features like this long linear period at the beginning, which. Uh, epidemiologists um, had difficulty explaining in the early phases without a coupled model. So the, uh, the general point is just that it, including um, uh, behavioral uh, dynamics in the uh, directly, even with simple variables in uh, responses can actually improve the modeling. And one could imagine a similar sort of thing taking place with respect to the immune system that uh, simple uh, Simple, even very simple sort of one-dimensional models of uh, uh, the brain's state of happiness or whatever interacting with the immune system can put in the line with your previous comments may potentially um, explain more of uh, people's uh, responses and getting sickness, etc. Et to um, uh, and and uh, and allow for these sort of strange situations where I've sort of proven non. A medicine that proven the in double blind tests doesn't work in the actual practical context actually does because there are other things playing a role. Um, but mm -hmm. that, that's sort of a little bit on the side from uh, where I, I sort of see some of the interests in the discussion that you with Rudy uh, uh, that you were having um, sort of going and uh, the way this is developing. I mean, it seems like you're you're fundamentally interested in the um, in this development of uh, uh, autonomy and uh, living and looking at the immune system as a living system and uh, you you're using if I understand it correctly you're using the sort of time scale issue as an example of uh, a way of sort of sharpening concepts with respect to this autonomy uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that that I mean that that looks uh, sort of fundamentally uh, uh, attractive um, 
from from the sort of population evolutionary biology point of view, um, getting back to Rudy's di uh, comments on your diagram uh, early on, um, mm -hmm. the, the interactions between individuals in affecting evolutionary outcome uh, traditionally sort of uh, uh, were introduced uh, in the first sort of wave of complications of evolutionary theory from sort of uh, simple uh, survival of the fittest selectionism uh, in the, and the population biologists sort of use the term of uh, uh, frequency dependent fitness. Uh, and so, so in the diagram that you're presenting, one aspect of what you're talking about is, uh, seems to be, uh, but it's not the only aspect, uh, but is this dimension of, uh, uh, of so-called frequency dependent fitness that the multiple um, instances of, uh, of, of the population are affecting each other's fitness and so that this becomes a more complex environment, right? Mm -hmm. or, and and uh, and changes uh, the nature of the environment. So so there's uh, Rudy and myself did quite a lot of work on the origin of cooperation in uh, uh, populations uh, which do have interactions and how how stability of that cooperation can take place, which ultimately is sort of relevant to the um, cancer discussion, etc. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and. So that the sort of questions which I think we both Rudy and I are quite familiar with as, no, asking yeah, is yeah. sort of what is the uh, potential no, for sort no, of parasitic uh, decomposition of the uh, immune system? Why why don't variants that just exploit the existence of the immune system um, take it over and, and ruin it? And uh, this is uh, uh, perhaps what happens with. Uh, with various forms of disease outcomes that can only be regulated at the individual sort of death level, which you were referring to about this with the, the so, uh, time's got a clock. So in, anyway, that, I just wanted to give you a few more uh, uh, possible connections of discussion things uh, uh, with people at the ECLT to sort of, uh, uh, that might be interesting to pursue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can only tell you one idea so again, <laughs> I have to say that a lot of the stuff I talked about today is stuff I've been thinking about for a long time, um, but have only been able to address or in, or work on sort of in tangent to basically doing a lot of bioinformatics on B-cell repertoires. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have this sabbatical is because I feel like I'm enough of a grown-up right now that I can stop doing that and start doing this, or I'd like to. Uh -huh. So... Um, um, and I have to say, one of the ideas that, uh, to me, I think there's one of the things I'd like to test maybe, although I'm not sure exactly how, but um, is that maybe um, the form of cooperation uh, could be in, um, well, I need to look at your papers, but uh, I, I basically the um, the systems, so whether you look at neurons or if you look at the immune system, they both... Uh, share this characteristic that they um, can um, shift what size what, what's this which part of the system is is now focusing on this on a thing they can shift from mm -hmm. um, only a few cells to suddenly having a huge population that is involved with a certain response um, and in order to do that you have both mechanisms to um, um, upregulate the response and to to pull to pull more and more components into the response and then you have things that kill it so you have to have an excitation and you have to have uh, um, I keep forgetting words in English you have to have an excitation and you have to have a depression an inhibition an excitation inhibition. And inhibition. Yeah, inhibition is what I want to say and one of the things that I think I'm seeing in the immune system and I think is also true for neurons is that um, to some degree you could do excitation even just with one cell <clears throat> or with many copies of one cell behaving on its own behaviors and inhibition requires cooperation and and sorry and I should say well the propagation of inhibition requires cooperation um, and and that is a model that I would like to um, 
to pursue because I think um, one of the things that I think is a little bit mysterious and, and, and I think is important here is that I, I suspect that complexity is not just something that is accumulating by as an, as a, as a, as an outcome of sort of more and more life. I think we actually the, the systems that we have, the, our systems where complexity helps you stay stable um, and that the features of the system. And then in some sense, when we jump to a new niche, when suddenly you can live in the, you know, when you go from just being unicellular to being multicellular, when you, these are the thing that allows that shift is that now you have a mechanism, there's enough interactions that the complexity of the system is actually generating stability and not just, it's not just a feature of, it's not just, because when complexity doesn't generate stability, the minute things are not copacetic, the whole thing collapses basically. And we know, right, so far, touch wood, things have collapsed, but they never collapse um, really all the way back. They... There are papers dealing with the selection of stability associated with the uh, DAISY model and uh, the Gaia, you know, looking at mm. the evolution of uh, the planet's ability to do some level of uh, self uh, homeostasis, uh, 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 which sounds weirder than it is actually but the there are i mean there are uh, uh but there's it's certainly the transition from selection of individual traits to selection of stability has been discussed in that context in case uh, you're interested in pursuing that particular thing that, that, that that's another connection that would be of, of some interest um Sort yeah. of to use an iconic I, I, catchphrase, the immune system like a planet. Um, it's sort of <laughs> it's the the selection happening at the system yeah. level to maintain the uh, stability of the existence of the immune system in some sense. Um, you know that, I don't know if you know. Have you heard of Eshel Ben Yaakov? He was an Israeli physicist who made models of microbes. Um, uh, yes, I have. Uh, and I've seen his pattern. I mean, he did a lot of work on uh, on his pattern formation with uh, yes, bacterial with lawns, etc. Uh, right? So he he has this. He had this joke that he would tell about um, basically that uh, we exist as amazingly st stable environments for microbes, and if we piss them off too much, they'll get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I think it's that fair, but um, I do think that. Um, yeah. Well, um, the the other thing I wanted to ask you, um, if I can just sort of continue the conversation, everybody should feel free to butt in or stop us. But uh, I, the the other thing that I've found kind of interesting uh, uh, is the son of Rupert Sheldrake wrote mm -hmm. this book about uh, about. Uh, um, not mushrooms, but the the families to which mushrooms belong. Um, uh, um, what's it called? Anyway, uh, the uh, the dressing, in, amongst other things, the degree of control uh, that uh, uh, mushrooms and their entire family ho have over our um, uh, over our uh, actions. Uh, which is is similar to the uh, discoveries about bacteria controlling things, but it's it's taken it, it, it's a serious. He, he's a molecular biologist by training, and it, mm -hmm. it's a serious book worth uh, worth looking at. But he, he, his his uh, outcome is basically uh, well, thank you. Um, uh, his out his conclusion is basically that uh, uh, the uh, from the point of view of the um, of the other organism, we're existing as a vehicle for its own sort of propagation, and mm -hmm. uh, these sorts of relationships are, are, are becoming increasingly sort of uh, uh, well understood. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it extends in the book from everything from truffles to um, uh, to the microscopic scale. And uh, he also addresses this whole evolution of um, the, the eukaryotic cell and its um, cooperation as another um, sort of case in part, and the sort of networks of, of root trees, etc. But the, these these collective aspects of uh, or, or organisms, in some sense, orchestrating 
um, high level changes in other organisms uh, mm -hmm. uh, seems to be to be a, a sort of growing uh, awareness amongst biologists uh, that it plays a significant role. So it's it's not surprising that the, that there's a more more and more interest in the relationship between uh, the brain and how that works and the immune system. Um, uh, but but I think but I think again so. I, the way I like to think about it, though, is, is a little bit like the minute you're talking about something like us or like any animal that's made out of lots of little animals, um, you, you can describe what's going on from different scales and in different ways. And, and I don't think that one scale of explanation would necessarily be like the most correct one. So like my, I had, I had two supervisors, a physicist and an immunologist, mm -hmm. so in Solomon and Yuen Cohen, and um, Sorin used to say, like, yeah, I could explain, you know, if I had enough time and enough supercomputers, I could do everything with, uh, like, Schrodinger equations all the way down and explain everything like that. And if I was looking at the fox, but then if it's a fox and a rabbit, it's more satisfying and easier just to say the fox wants to eat the rabbit. Um, and I think when we look, basically we know more about the biome. So, like, I, I feel like Right now, if I was planning to colonize Mars, as opposed to, let's say, 70 years ago, I would be a little bit more worried that maybe we can't actually that easily just go off and live on a planet without a biome. Like, I, I don't know, because we, we've never really tried. We are living inside this... And, and there, was, there was a guy, I've forgotten his name, who talks about mass extinctions, and basically he says... Um, we're not in a mass extinction yet because most of this, when you see a really massive die-off, it includes microbes. It's like, I forget how many. Mm -hmm. um, like 80% or 70%. And when you hit that, then you can't do anything. And we're not there. Like So it's like, not like there's like a, if that starts dying off, then you're in a place where people, animals like us can't even begin to, because we're so it's dependent. Kind of, yeah. Right. So like the example I like for that is there are three um, symbiotic uh, bacteria that live in the bottom of the ocean. I can find it in the nature paper. It's a really cool paper. Two of them are anaerobic. They live in the bottom of the ocean. There's huge, like, there's huge populations of them, and they eat all the methane that should be coming out of the bottom of the ocean. And basically, they are consistently terraforming the planet to its oxidated, like, to the state where we like to live, basically. So it's like. The, the ecosystem is definitely not, you know, natural or like, I don't know, like it's natural means living things are modifying things. Um, but, but at the same time, like, I mean, I don't know why I do anything, but I, I don't think it's because of, um, it's hard for me to explain it as a network of mushrooms telling me to do stuff. So, so like, I, I think that well, we let, have, let me, ask, let me ask a specific question related to that. Do is it, is it possible to be a healthy human individual uh, without the the continual uh, tweaking through external disease of the immune system? So probably not. So then I, I, I think that's a good one. No, but I think not. So I think, uh, but I think, again, the constant tweaking though involves a lot of things that don't actually get you sick, right? So like your immune system is sitting there in your stomach and interacting all the time and you don't i mean it's actively doing something and i think if you lived in a completely sterile environment and only ate so these neutral proteins that had no, nothing living in them uh, you would get very very sick and it i think it would be the equivalent of you know like if you stick uh, if you give people curare poison and they can't move their eyes then they go blind so like your immune system has to see something has to interact with something i think a big chunk of that something is actually your body, not necessarily pathogens. But if you, but but it, or not necessarily bacteria, but the immune system is is expecting to have something to push against. And I think if you had nothing to push against, you would um, you'd go crazy. Basically, like sitting in in lockdown and never talking to anybody. The brain and the like. We need the interaction, but uh, but I don't think. So like those guys from Papua New Guinea, okay? 
So those guys from Papua New Guinea are living with a level of parasitic infection that is like we used to have a hundred years ago, or more than a hundred years ago. And um, they have a... So if, if, if I look at anybody, then the older you are, uh, the more mutated your B cells are as a population. So like a, a young person has mostly naive B cells um, that have never mutated. And an old person has mostly mutated B cells that have at some point been used for specific response and specific clones that are already triggered also to do something against some disease you already got. Okay, it's a bit like the human brain goes from being lots of neurons, less connections to less neurons, more connections. Okay? Um, and so, but, but if you look at that distribution of how mutated you are, there's a certain range. We all have the same range, more or less, no matter where we live, including even people in less developed places, not Papua New Guinea. The people in Papua New Guinea, the, old, the older people who are like 50, let's say, they have a mutation load that is like somebody with HIV, like on the edge of somebody with AIDS. It's, it's insane. It's like, it's a mutation. If you, when you, when the first time I started distribution, I was like, nah, like that. It's an outlier. Like, but it's like 14 people. They all look like that. So, um, we are a lot less sick than we could be. I don't think we want to be, oh, if we, if we like, want, like, we wouldn't die off if we were that sick. They don't die off in Papua New Guinea, but we would live less and we would have really stressed out immune systems. So I think it's like a lot of things. I think like we, if if you completely protect yourself from everything and never interact, like basically make your immune system bored, then some people would respond very badly to that and it, it, it wouldn't be good for your body probably. On the other hand, it's not... Um, don't I would I would never take my kids to be sick on purpose basically just to sort of activate the immune system. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. But, but that's an interesting point because as far as I know, uh, sports is quite a bit of stress for the mm -hmm. immune system, but but without making you sick. So uh, it's, <laughs> in uh, some it's, cases, yeah, in some <laughs> cases, in some cases, no. But see, that brings me. Well, it, it's it's interesting to think about whether the good thing about sport is actually that it yes it 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 pushes your immune system without destroying your body in most cases <laughs> at least. But I think I I think I, I think activity like sports is good for all of these systems. I think it's yeah. not it's not enough in the sense that uh, you can see this with allergies. I think some of the allergies that people get come from sort of overdoing the cleanliness and not uh, yeah. this stuff. And I think. Um, but, but I also think that the immune system has a lot of things to has a lot of things to interact with in our body. And so it, and also like a little bit we're confusing two parts of the immune system, which is you have a, um, a, a basically there is a part that's kind of like an, an extra extension of your stress response that's inside cells. It's innate. It's in every cell, not only in the in the vertebrates. All cells have some kind of an immune response, immune capability. But it also, in us, it also goes between cells and, and does a lot of things that have nothing to do with specificity. So I spent a lot of time basically talking about the, the system that has specificity of receptors to certain things that will activate it. But you also have an innate immune system that is very sophisticated and knows how to activate differently if it's a virus or a microbe, but also if it's a, a wound healing or if it's a, some other kind of oxygenating stress, it will do a coal. These things are, are, are related to each other. <clears throat> and so I think what Rudy is saying is true. I mean, sports can help you activate it. But I think in all of these things, it's a, it, it's really a, it's a, it's a fine. So I, basically, well, none of us is getting out alive. Okay. So, these things make it better, but using it eventually breaks it, including our, mm. all of these systems, right? They're not really made, they're made to be adaptive and to learn things, but when they adapt, in some of these adaptations at least, it's a, there is a loss, and some of it is actually dependent, and I didn't talk enough about that, and I think that's also something that's very interesting to, to think about how to model is that uh, this idea of... Um, the fact that you have copies. So you have many, many copies of cells that they kind of do the same thing and then you give them more specialized roles. And and because of that, you have less copies, but you have more 
specific capabilities. So I think that is also, I, I, I don't know. Well, that's, you, not, that's something that Rudy and I have uh, studied at length at the molecular level with respect to okay. populations of evolving molecules wow. about the relationships between population diversification of function and how the different functions oh. sort of uh, work together so that there's quite a lot of not known about the evolution of this sort of thing at the level of simple individuals um i i'm sort of sort of we're sort of tackling things from the opposite ends of the spectrum i, oh. I want to ask you another question which uh people may know more about it than i know uh uh i mean there may be, this may be a silly question um to what extent is there an immune system inside a single cell i mean it okay. there is so, a lot of the mechanisms so it's a lot known about that or um i don't know if i'd say a lot it's 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 definitely a very Yes. Oh, I don't know. A lot is known and much is still not known. But we, we have, you have a, a whole family of receptors called TLRs um, that are very conserved and whose internal signaling pathways are also quite conserved. And they are very much involved with the detecting sort of general determinants of pathogens. Um, and, and, in, and then in addition, you have this very conserved so the stress response, which also some, has somewhat of a memory, okay? So I think, mm -hmm. um, so like, you, you, and, and so the, the, these signaling molecules, these receptors for, um, so the receptors for LPS, which is a sort of the, the microbial membrane uh, molecule, there are receptors for double-stranded DNA and RNA and specific um, methylate, methylations on DNA and RNA that you wouldn't see floating around if it wasn't a virus or a dead cell. And the and the way they signal the cell is actually directly related to the stress response, the NF kappa B response, and so if they. Mm -hmm. And what what's interesting about them, and that's actually another modeling point, maybe. And I I, I have this poster. Usually, they work like to me at least. It looks like they're working like a perceptron. So you have lots of different um, kind of unique receptors for different kinds of determinants. They all go through this. And if kappa B might eighty eight, like there's three or four or five molecules that summarize what's going on, and then they go out into many different kinds of responses. Because an antiviral response in a cell is not the same as an antimicrobial response. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely how it looks. And and except there is one kind of slug that I once saw a poster for, and I was I I was shocked to be the only person who was really excited by it. But this slug has parallel roots for every one of its TLRs. And I've never gotten to like actually trying to see how you would model it, but it, it's in it's in the back of my head somewhere like thinking because mm -hmm. because there definitely is a, there's a there's a there is an immune system for every cell and there's a again my old supervisor there's, there's, there's this everywhere we look there's an immune system. Plants also have immune systems. You you need something that will um sort of on the one hand um deal with cells in your body that no longer want to cooperate and on the other hand deal with parasites or freeloaders that want to just um take what's yours and um the interesting thing is that and you probably know about this do you know the experiment uh i forget what the kind of bacteria it was that they uh they put the wall they, they make a colony and they put a wall and they let the colony go uh, on this side of the wall and then depending on the length of the yeah. wall once they meet they this either is, this is the adam 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 Atz stuff yeah. right yeah yes. in, I, I, in, I'm, I'm, in britain yeah with the co you're doing computations with mm. no i don't know no, this is before different. that this was a this was a straightforward <laughs> experiment of uh, i forget the name of the molecule but it's a kind of a toxicity inducing molecule mm -hmm. that bacteria do to non people who aren't of their species. But in bacteria, exactly. saying what the species is is kind of um, ad hoc. And so yeah. they discovered that depending on how long since the last time you met this group of bacteria, you will ah, yeah, either just baby, combine yeah. with them or start killing them. And it was, and, it, and, it, and, and again, I've forgotten the name, I'm horrible at names, mm -hmm. but it's a very cool experiment because it's really like size, which translates to time and then divisions and if it's a small barrier, then they just combine again. If it's a long barrier, they start killing each other.
Um, anyway, I so I've written down a lot of what you said, and I especially will try to look up the things you did about cooperation because I, 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 I um. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're obviously not the only ones who did lots about cooperation, but no. we were sort of involved with that. And yeah, that might be a might be a route into the wider literature on this. Yeah, well, but at the molecular level, it's a big topic because the origin of life, in some sense, is a uh, question of uh, growing from uh, uh, from a sort of molecular single molecule sort of basis to a sort of cooperative activity, and so the the origin of cooperation is linked to the origin of life in a fundamental way. And so it's regarded sure. as one of the sort of core. I mean, problems. there's, I, my, you know, the Daniel Segrin, the one Lancet paper about this uh, mm -hmm. network of chemicals that self replicate? Yes. Yes. So I think that to me was always like the proof of origin, like the fact that you just needed complexity and then eventually it'll start multiplying. I thought that was, that, that to me was a very um, um, heartening idea, basically. Like, yeah, enough complexity, the whole thing starts exploding. Um, but, what I, but what was interesting about what you said before to me is that um, I, 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 re I recently read a book by Piaget about um, it, it, this idea of the, of the phenocopy. Um, so he, it turns out that one of his last books was actually an attempt to get people to stop saying he was Lamarckian. And he, and he really describes very nicely um, this idea that, that you you have a bunch of cells that are behaving in a similar phenotype, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the same genotype or the same border between genotype and how they behave. And in fact, probably, and and, and to me actually, it, it means probably they don't, right? So if, if it's if it's a robust, stable behavior, and they all have the same phenotype, probably they have different combinations so that if things change a little bit, you'll still maintain the phenotype. And, and and that to me again goes back to what I was saying about so how do you know that you shifted from an autoimmune state to a not autoimmune state or suddenly you're close to an autoimmune state you won't see it from the phenotype a second before but you might see it from how diverse those phenotypes are when they become less diverse how you can get to that phenotype then a small break will suddenly shift you to autoimmunity and what you said about how like I, I need I would like to know how what you mean by the, the fact that you have that you're talking about the actual molecular underpinnings of that and I want like did you check how they also relate to the genotype like how far away they are or how they are restricted by a specific genotype well uh, I mean the background of this is that uh, building on early work uh, uh, which went back to experimental work on the Q beta virus um, mm -hmm. way back there were various in vitro model systems, cell-free systems with molecules, uh, which uh, demonstrated self-replication uh, and evolution uh, without cells. And mm -hmm. these systems um, were sort of important for developing the, the theory of uh, the incipients of evolution. And so if you're, mm -hmm. if you're dealing with uh, entities that uh, with or without uh, the help of single molecule enzymes can replicate, then uh, you can look at a lot of the questions about what is a phenotype and what is a genotype but in terms of chemical kinetics of the proliferation processes. And uh, you can look at this spatially and, mm -hmm. and look at the uh, spatial structuring impact on this and uh, the way in which uh, uh, binding between molecules influences uh, the outcome. And so you can do a lot of uh, sort of molecular level interacting with biological level uh, considerations much more directly in this sort of uh, space of uh, uh, of entities, and mm -hmm. uh, and there was quite a there's a large sort of uh, body of work over a span of uh, 30 40 years by many groups looking at what the evolutionary properties are at the molecular level of such systems and how far they can take you up the ladder of complexity towards. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, what we understand as, as cellular systems. And so uh, Doran Lancet's work um, uh, belongs to a particular sort of uh, facet of this that thinks that you can get very far without having anything like a genetic copying mm -hmm. uh, uh, component uh, in that. And uh, 
but there's a whole family of models and approaches associated with this. A lot of them assuming that you have some genetic copying mechanism uh, from the modeling perspective or looking at systems which do have that experimentally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, the, well, the, the, the construction of chemical self-replicators which don't use enzymes uh, has of course uh, uh, by uh, various groups, including uh, Gunter von Krugowski's uh, group in, in Germany. Um, uh, but ha and the, there's various people who looked at self-replicating protein molecules, including um, Ashkenazi in Israel. Who I also know, uh, but there's a whole sort of uh, world of people looking at molecular, uh, simple systems, trying to sort of bypass mm -hmm. the unknown complexity of the cell and look at how evolution works. Uh, also, with a view yeah. to understanding the origin of life uh, uh, better. But uh, and these systems have led significantly, I think, to a lot of the understanding about how messenger RNA uh, works, because a lot of the systems used messenger RNA or used RNA and the smaller ver versions mm -hmm. of the messenger RNA to, um, to, to explore these systems. And they had an interesting connection with viral systems because the HIV virus provided some interesting candidate um, isothermal self-amplifying molecule systems that were then studied in great depth Sort of without all of the uh, cell expression uh, uh, component, um, and so there's been a sort of uh, uh, marching together of uh, research on viral evolution with research on more elementary sort of chemical evolution, um, uh, and people have been sort of looking for good systems and a lot of this work moved from work on purely homogeneous sort of population kinetics of chemical kinetics of growth to spatially structured systems of one or the other kind and so there was a big development when people realized that it makes a big difference to the evolutionary outcome how things are structured spatially which is clearly yeah. the case also with the immune system and yeah, all of us are most type we're, we're very structured. It's not a, not a bag, but yeah. Anyway, lots of things to talk about on that front. You reminded me also that like in, in if we're looking at cells and how they behave. So now, just a, it, it's just reminded me because like it's the opposite of fungus and bacteria. Is that if we look into the cell now, then in terms of the players that are playing and activating and interacting with things, you also have small RNAs and small peptides that um oh, and and these and the whole bunch like these lumps of unstructured proteins and all kinds of things that are even more noisy and stochastic but hap but at least nucleotic cells are all over the place and they're not um they're not just there basically they have some right. controlling function that um or, or expression um, Patterns of, no, that, example, that, or... that that affect things, or that um, or that uh, buffer things, so that you have less change or more change whenever. Yeah, I, I, hmm. we, yeah, it, it's um, the system. The thing is that the system really behaves, or um, Again, to be completely philosophical on the, on the verge of, of, of theological, it, it, the, the thing is that it's it's really um, the whole thing is um, whenever you think, whenever you do know something, it seems like the whole thing works on its own, like it's miraculous. But it's actually um, the whole system is building itself up so that it can do amazing things. But it starts out from a single cell. That then gives instruction to a few more cells that interact with each other and then build some more cells. It, it it's constructed from the inside out, and then you have a living thing that knows how to construct other things or interact with things. And um, and and to me that that's always been the problem I've had when arguing with religious people about whether evolution exists or not. I'm like, okay, so you believe? So somebody shows you a miraculous process that works. And then you can't believe it because you imagine the God that needs to make things the way you make things. And you can't actually accept, like, it's like, <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, it's like, 
I don't necessarily believe in a, a guy with a beard or in any kind of omnipotent, whatever, omniscient being. But let's say I wanted to build one and he had to make living systems that actually can make choices. What if that's the way to do it? Like, they need to evolve, they need to have a biome around them, they need to have all these things, and then they have degrees of freedom that allow them to actually make choices, do stuff. Like, you know, you can't make a square by making a circle. You can't make a human being without evolution. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know, but that, that that's... <laughs> well, we could go further down that philosophical dire direction, uh, asking about the sort of the right physics, the, the necessary physics to even create individuals. And yeah. I'm afraid I'm going to have to bomb out. Uh, no, no. Now. Yeah, so I, I, the fact I, that this is really interesting, but uh, I, I want to just personally thank you again for a, a, a thought provoking talk. Thank you. My pleasure. No, I, <clears throat> I fully agree with John. Uh, unfortunately, also, also I have to go soon, but I, I mean, first, I, I would be very fond of continuing this sort of theological discussion or let's say philosophical discussion because that's a topic the older I get the more I'm interested in for various <laughs> reasons but uh, there is let's say also a more down-to-earth topic you mentioned several times uh, the term perceptron and two guys heavily involved with the ECLT, Harold Fellerman and Stefan Scheidecker, they are thinking about the immune system and uh, the perceptron as sort of an information processing structure, which is uh, very general in biology. As a, it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of a general paradigm. And I would, if you allow, I would like to bring you together with these two guys because uh, they have, and they just brought out a number of papers on the topic. And I think this could be an interesting discussion. I would love it. And, Please. Okay, great. So really, let me thank you for this obviously stimulating talk. Thank you, guys. Which has been proven, so to speak. And uh, I'm looking forward to your visit. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm also looking forward to mine, and I feel a lot um, better now that there will definitely be things to talk about. Thank okay, you very bye much. Bye for now, then. Bye-bye. 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 They throw it, they throw it. Yeah, you, you have been in, in high for your home, sir. No, I was in Jerusalem. I, ah, Jerusalem. I was okay. working okay. under the supervision of uh, Scott Carpatrick at uh, Universita High Ifrit. That's the place to be. That's where I was too, as an as a undergrad and a graduate student. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see, there are more connections than one thinks. Oh, for <laughs> sure. I am okay. sure finding many. Uh, bye -bye. I have a final question. Oh, okay. you, know, uh, you were talking about the free will yes. uh, in this discussion for the last few minutes. Do you really think that there is a free will or do you think that it is an illusion only which we have and that there is no free will but we are governed by molecules only? So I, I think <laughs> so I, I will tell so personally I only believe I have free will. And that's how I, 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 I believe I, I'm an existentialist. I think I set up my own morals and my own fate. But I also think that uh, regardless of how we feel, um, it's a bit like I was saying before about the fox and the rabbit. So we have many ways of describing what is going on. Mm -hmm. And I think the way of action, of saying that things have action that they chose, mm -hmm. which in the end is free will, is... Um, is usually or often in biology a very useful way of describing things and sometimes more useful than talking about the molecular description because the molecular description sometimes is so complex that it's a noisy that it's hard to describe what is going on and I prefer the way that other people get out of it is they use a functional description they say this is for this mm -hmm. this is for catching pathogens this is for holding up and I find that in biology the same system, the same object, has different functions under different contexts, and often it's easier for me to talk about what is what is the goal, or what is the thing that is going on, what is the process, or what is the goal, yeah, what, what, and then it becomes free will. So like you can see, when you look at immune cells in the, under the microscope, T cells and B cells, when one of them becomes activated, they seem to suddenly start actively hunting for antigen. You see it. Instead of moving like this, 
yeah. they move like this. Okay. And, uh, and 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 again, I don't know if they have free will, but they have a, a motivated action, mm-hmm. and it's easier and it's it becomes more easy for me to describe what's going on by that. You could easily say they're more directed or less directed. They're not random in their motion. But then the more the animal becomes multicellular, and then especially when I talk about myself and my kids and my pets, then yeah. not describing free will to them is, uh, it just becomes very complicated to me to discuss them. So yeah, yeah. I would agree to that position. Mm-hmm. But, but I also, for me personally, for Uri, I behave as if I have free will. I don't agree with Mark Twain. I think he was just a pessimist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway. So okay. good. Thank you for that question as well. Okay. It was great. Guys, I had a really good time. I am looking forward to uh, more interactions and um, thank you for letting me speak for so long. Uh, no problem at all. Here. We have time. <laughs> we have to. Oh, we take our time for yes. that interesting discussions, man. See, that's the essence of science, what you're doing here. For, or at least for me, that that's the fun part of science. No, you, for said me before, you, you, you said before that all the other guys do the work and, and I, I can unfortunately i have to uh, to agree to that I, if if i ask myself what do i have more filling out excel sheets or doing science then i have unfortunately to say it's excel sheets and so i really like such uh, such occasions thanks Thank a lot thank you bye bye shabbat shalom shabbat shalom thank you so much